I put designs of the new Spinosaurus, as well as the subject of this video, on the Edge Redbubble store for stickers and shirts. Go check them out with the link in the description and the comment section below. My content contains images and footage of nature. Some of this content may be disturbing. Viewer discretion is advised. Butterflies and moths are an incredible group of invertebrates. Like many arthropods and the amphibians, they go through a few different markedly different stages in their life cycles. As we've learned in our grade school days, they start out as egg capsules laid by the adults, hatch into grub-like creatures with stubby legs, and cocoon into a pupa. Within the pupa, they decompose their own bodies and recombine it into the general shape of the flappy, proboscis-faced idiots we love to ooh and ah at. For those of you scared by moths and butterflies, sorry, I have no sympathy for you. They're the most harmless little bastards, with pretty colors or adorable little fuzzy bodies. I'm not saying to just get over it or anything, but, you know, just get over it for it. Why am I talking about butterflies on a paleontology channel? Guess you missed the elephant and chupacabra in the logo. Or the whole extinct extent extraordinary thing. Eh, that's okay, I forget too sometimes. The thing I really find fascinating about moths and butterflies, which are collectively known as Lepidopterans, is the dichotomy between their larval and imago stages. Oh yeah, did you know the adult stage of a Lepidopteran is called an imago? I only know that because that's what they call adult Mothra, or her rainbow son Leo. There's an incredible diversity of shapes, colors, and structures in both adult and larvae of both butterflies and moths. They even have examples in the fossil record with some really cool patterns and wing shapes. The imago stages of Lepidopterans are the obvious go-to when teaching about the stunningly gorgeous structures of iridescence, the awesome patterns used for camouflage, intimidating predators without even trying, advertising your toxic, inedible gooey bits, and the ones that mimic them. That being said, I think we don't often think about how diverse larval stages of these creatures truly are. They're basically two different animals. In the future, I want to talk about some of the many cool groups of caterpillars and their less cool imagos. Some of my favorite are the dragon-headed caterpillars of the common nawab, the caterpillar of the pus moth, which looks like a gaping abscess, the super spiny, super colorful saddleback caterpillar, and perhaps the prettiest and most bizarre of the bunch, the jewel caterpillar. Plenty of articles and videos on these critters have compared them to gummy candies, blown glass, jewels, and sea slugs. I agree with those comparisons, but to me, as someone who grew up in the 2000s, they look more like the spiky rubber ball earrings and jewelry punks, goths, and emos would wear to be counterculture. Anyone remember that? Just me? The jewel caterpillars are known scientifically as the Dalceridae. This group is broken up into the Acragonae and the Dalcerinae. These guys are rather rare, and only about 80 species are known to exist in the tropical rainforests of central, south, and southernmost North America. The caterpillars, as you can see, are characterized by a sticky coating covering their bodies, which form series of rounded cones, which I shall henceforth refer to as nubbins. Unlike many other types of caterpillars, these guys move around on suckers sticking out of their bellies. They don't really have the little stubby legs you might find on a monarch caterpillar or a common inchworm. Another interesting characteristic they all share is the array of beautiful colors so many of them flaunt. There's green, highlighter yellow, amber yellow with red and black patterning, completely clear or white with red or orange accents, there's yellow, blue, and green, and this one with oranges and greens. There are also solidly colored ones, like the white and clear colored ones of the Minocraga Janus, or this blood red one, and this orange one. The jewel caterpillars and their sister groups, Limacotidae and Megalopegidae, form a group colloquially known as slug caterpillars for their similar appearance to the shellless mollusks. They're also called slug caterpillars due to the sucker feet thing I mentioned earlier. Why do these caterpillars have those little jelly nubbins? That's been subject to a few experiments and many scientists' careers. 
They don't start out with them. In fact, upon hatching, the caterpillars look a lot more like a garden variety caterpillar. Once they put on some weight, they quickly develop these nubbins. Once a layer of nubbins is formed on the back, they're sloughed off each time the caterpillar molts. The bottommost layer becomes the new outside nubbin layer, and the body secretes the jelly into those nubbins, and the cycle repeats till it reaches the pupa stage. It's currently known what the nubbins do, but it still remains a mystery exactly why they have them. See, those little spines in the center of the nubbins? Those seem to be a kind of structural support. The nubbins themselves are made of a jelly-like substance and are rather sticky. It is assumed the nubbins are used for protection. The internal structure spines erupt from the caterpillar's true body, which is the colorful patterns you see through the generally translucent jelly nubbins. Both spines and nubbins are rather fragile and break off easily. When an attacker comes upon the hapless larva and tries to take a bite, they get a mouthful of jelly and a spine. That can't be too good for your oral health, right? That's what the researchers tried to prove when they put these caterpillars to the test. Entomologist Dr. Mark Epstein and colleagues conducted experiments on the caterpillars by exposing them to ants. They placed caterpillars in a petri dish and put a few ants in to observe what they did. Most of the time, ants would close in to inspect the caterpillar with their antennae, but then moved along. A few, though, would venture a bite, ending up with a mouthful of goop they worked frantically to dislodge. Some would even get stuck to the caterpillar without dislodging the gelatinous projections at all. Consequently, this study did not find out whether the goo is toxic or not, only that it provides a mechanical disadvantage to any critter dumb enough to go for a bite. Whether there's any toxicity, or the goo is just too much to chew, it seems to be an effective defense. These caterpillars are brazen about meandering around the open leaves of their tropical homes. They use their belly suckers to zoom around at a relatively fast clip, and this may be why they don't worry about being seen. Most caterpillars spend their time on the underside of leaves to hide from would-be predators, but the jewel caterpillars crawl over the tops of leaves with their dazzling colors on full display. Interestingly, the jewel caterpillar's close relatives, the Lamicodids, deploy a different countermeasure, nasty stinging spines. These caterpillars are slower than their bejeweled cousins, which you might expect, since jewel caterpillars can only temporarily incapacitate their foes. The jewel caterpillar's colorful gooey nubbins provide the message of, hey, keep walking, you won't want a mouthful of me. They have places to be and leaves to eat. Meanwhile, the Lamicodids are sending a much more aggressive message of, touch me, you die, move along. They're slower because they can be. Why defend yourself like this? As a big tube-shaped slab of fat and protein, caterpillars have one of only a few mechanisms to refrain from kicking the bucket early. They could be camouflaged and remain completely still while trying to find enough time to stuff their face with a good battery of food to grow. They could expend precious resources to brandish extreme weapons to give themselves enough leisure time to stuff their faces. Or, like the jewel caterpillar, they could have a temporary defense that incapacitates but doesn't kill predators to give themselves enough time to suction their way to safety. I imagine they don't expend as much resources to create the nubbins as the other caterpillars which produce the spines and hairs and venoms and poisons. Despite the outer nubbin defense, these caterpillars are still subject to parasitism. Fly larvae of the Tachinidae family have developed a technique to counter the defenses of the jewel caterpillar. Like a lion which turns a porcupine over to get to its softer belly, the tachinid maggot maneuvers itself under the caterpillar and drills a hole through its soft, delicious underside. The maggot then takes up residence inside the caterpillar and feeds off all the food the caterpillar stuffs its face with. Some period of time later, the tachinid maggot clicks on and quite voraciously and in very short order literally consumes the inside of the caterpillar. Now a large maggot within a mostly lifeless husk of the jewel caterpillar, it either eats its way out and cocoons in the soil nearby, or stays cozy and pupates within the body of the caterpillar. When they manage to evade the dangers of parasites, the jewel caterpillars begin to pupate. Like many other caterpillars, exemplified here by a Dulcerides ingenita, they form a cocoon-like cuticle on the outside of their bodies and begin spinning a silken outer cocoon, just like Mothra. If you thought their larvae were weird, just take a look at the adults which emerge from the silken cocoon. The adults look like animal, but with black, soulless, googly eyes. The adult moth is as varied in color as the caterpillars. This one, the adult of Akraga mori, also known as the tangerine furry legs, 
is almost as orange as the US commander in briefs, or, or maybe a Cheeto. Others appear blanch white, an Alfredo cream with brown speckles, fruity peach toned wings with dark hairs and orange limbs, and eye popping black and white, among others. There isn't a lot of information out there on the adult form, but from the looks of it, they have a unique arrangement of their limbs, making them look rather goofier than contemporary nocturnal moths and nectar drinking butterflies. Compared to other butterflies and moths, they're rather rare, so only more research on them will help explain why they've evolved their unique defense strategy. Something's been bugging me this whole time looking at the nubbin pillars. They look really familiar. Right, they were the inspiration for the Pokemon Snom and the Evolution Frost Moth, though they got the transition from Glassy Jelly Baby to Orange Buffoon Moth kinda wrong. That about wraps it up for these critters. Let me know in the comments below about any other group of cool insects you want me to cover. I can't wait to talk about other kinds of freaky weird caterpillars. If you like this video, discover the like button and subscribe to my channel for more content like this. If you want to join my special snowflake club, bump uglies with the notification bell as well, just so you're in the know with everything Edge. Thanks for watching. Bum bum bum